So as the nation is really addressing police reform and um, mayors are talking about making changes in the policing units and departments and police guilds and there's a cry for civilian oversight of law enforcement. There's also a call for defunding police. There are also um, many ideas floating out there about how to just wipe and reload the whole law enforcement um, process and system, the institution of policing. So I know that I'm just one voice, one small voice. I don't have any titles anymore. I don't have any kind of you know authority or position. Um, but I have experience, I have knowledge, I've invested a lot of, you know, hundreds of probably thousands of hours, um, researching and advocating long before Black Lives Matter was a popular trendy thing. I was leading the marches and protests here in Spokane in 2014, um, 2015, of course, five months after I achieved both the, the position of chair of the Police Ombudsman Commission as well as the president of the NAACP chapter locally. Um, both of those were January appointments and um, in June of that same year, 2015, my leadership was completely unraveled. So the leadership positions of president of the NAACP and the chair which is, you know, the top leading position for police oversight and police accountability for the city of Spokane, um, was a combination that was not very liked by the chief of police and many other people in the municipal um, system here in the city. So it's no surprise that my character was attacked. The media scandal um, really undid all of my leadership in the wake of the killing of a black man, Lorenzo Hayes, by the Spokane Police Department officers at the county jail, which was under the sheriff's jurisdiction. And so both the sheriff and the chief of police had their necks on the line and um, took out the commission, basically undid the commission by removing me and two other commissioners as well um, quietly because nobody was really paying attention because everybody was worried about whether my parents were black or white and um, therefore got all of those officers off with no consequences because even though it was ruled a homicide it was um, decided that there was no malice when they killed Lorenzo Hayes therefore the officers had no consequences so really it was a local tragedy not just for Lorenzo Hayes um, himself but and his family, but also for justice and also for kind of shutting down police reform, not only for Spokane, but at the time, what a lot of people don't know is I was working with the Department of Justice to build Spokane as a mid-sized city model under the Obama collaborative reform policy and strategy in order to duplicate that police reform in other cities, which could have, if effective, could have prevented something like the George Floyd situation. So um, all of that to just say that some of us have been working on this for years and have um, taken you know, great personal sacrifices as well in terms of coming close to change, but then having uh, leadership of activists, um, you know, just unraveled and taken out. So before change actually is institutionalized. So a lot of times there are recommendations, there are suggestions. Trump just gave an executive order with kind of two of those things, like recommending building a nationwide database um, for cops, for bad cops, or for cops that have excessively used force, also um, recommending the co-responders and mental health professional going along. But once again, these are not mandates. And if it's just a recommendation practice, then it is not effective. In my experience with police oversight, if you just have recommendation authority as a civilian uh, branch of law enforcement oversight, 
you don't have any authority, any real authority with teeth. So without decision-making authority, if there's just recommendation authority, that makes the changes optional for law enforcement. And just like a lot of other big you know, institutions, um, people in law enforcement are not eager to change. They're not eager to add things on their to-do list, let alone wipe and reload the whole list. So it takes a lot of um, integrity. It takes a lot of um, inspiration and investment and dedication and commitment to push change through. But it also takes from the top down a mandate or decision-making authority, not just recommendations or recommendation authority. So why am I standing here with this big binder? This weighs about eight pounds. This is the book. This is all the paperwork that I got to read um, when I became a um, commissioner. And this was actually before I was unanimously voted as chair of the commission. So it's a commissioner resource binder. Now I can't, of course, read to you from it because it's confidential and um, I love my children too much to put myself in a situation where I'm breaching confidentiality here. But um, there, there are annual reports in here, there are mid-year reports, and this is all before I actually joined the commission. Um, in short, and this is probably not going to be well liked, but in short, this is a bunch of a waste, just wasted time. This is a this is a bunch of BS because all of these reports it cites so many you know every year um, incidents, not just use of force incidents, but also critical incidents. A critical incident means it resulted in a death. So use of force that resulted in a civilian being killed by a police officer. Um, there are also warrants and arrests. Um, this is a history of just two years of in a small, you know, mid-sized city, Spokane, of the complaints filed, um, the ombudsman at the time, you know, basically reviewing the complaints, looking into it. Um, but all of this is basically in the spirit of trust but verify. In other words, this person reviewing all of this, all of these incidents that people took the time to report, which is not, um, you know, something to be taken lightly. Like these reports are, um, you know, somebody having a situation, taking the time and having the hope and good faith to come to the ombudsman, the police ombudsman, and say, we need you to look into this. And what was done was basically um, to trust the police and just verify, in other words, like double check that, oh, okay, looks pretty good. Looks like they did um, what they should have done. Looks like, you know, nothing needs to be done about that incident. So, this particular binder, there are very few um, situations in here. This also includes internal affairs investigations. So the, the ombudsman is really heavy, so I'm gonna put it down. Um, the ombudsman also, and the, the commission, we looked into the um, internal affairs that were supposed to review in IA investigations. Now, once again, and I don't mean to, you know, just kind of um, brush this aside, but yes, it's, it's important to have eyes watching and evaluating and reviewing this information. But if the people, the citizens, the civilians on the commission or the ombudsman themselves, um, if, if we do not have the authority to actually change or implement changes, then it's a big waste of time in a sense because you can do not, you know, you, you basically just have all this information and you, you can't change anything. It's up to the good faith of the chief of police um, to actually 
listen to your recommendations and want to change and then structure those changes into police training, recruitment, retention policies, um, limiting the police guild oversight reach, um, you know, all of the, you know, allowing ride-alongs for civilians or co-responders to come to incidents, all of that is basically at the discretion of the chief of police. Now, boiling all this down to what you can do, if you're just an average YouTube watcher, if you're 18 or older, you can vote. Now, why voting is important, I know some people don't believe in it, they think their vote isn't gonna count, they think their vote is gonna be um, thrown away, erased, um, you know, screwed with in some way, right? So people have kind of given up on voting, some people. Other people are diehard, dedicated, you know, just committed to the voting process already, so they're already on board. So I'm not talking to you, but if you don't vote, you need to vote in local elections. Now, a lot of times the local elections sneak in when it's not a presidential year. So a lot of people just show up to vote for the president of the United States because that's what gets all the media attention. But the mayor that you elect chooses the chief of police in a lot of cities. The chief of police is not an elected office in Spokane. So who the mayor is is going to literally dictate who the chief of police is, which will literally decide, you know, whether or not somebody um, like, you know, myself or the other commissioners. By the way, all of this was volunteer time, unpaid, so that's also an imbalance. Um, we were supposed to be the, you know, an equal balance because it's the commission answers to the mayor and the chief of police answers to the mayor. So we're supposed to be able to hold the chief of police and the police department accountable. However, the chief of police and all the cops get paid. The commission, we got zero um, for all of our time and even risk literally um, all of the hours of doing ride-alongs with the officers. We were not provided protection vests or, or weapons or anything of that nature. So we were really risking our lives, even going into um, violent or dangerous situations that would happen um, during, you know, a routine, just ride along day. You know, whatever happened, we, we went. Um, so all that to say that the power is imbalanced. If you're paying one person and not paying the other person, clearly that person that you're not paying is going to have to, you know, chase, you know, work a job, um, spend an, a lot of time on some kind of income making um, source in order to pay the bills, in order to support their habit of the advocacy or activism work in that position. So it straps you with limited time. It also um, ended up not being an equal check and balance again because we had recommendation authority only and the chief of police had decision making authority <laughs> so we could recommend till we we're blue in the face all day long um all these things and they could just say we don't want to basically and there's nothing that we could do about it so in my meetings with the department of justice they basically encouraged uh, me as the chair of the commission to seek to wipe and reload the reach of the commission to implement decision-making authority. Now that was super radical, not well liked by the city government. And before we had a chance to do that, you know, this whole craziness over whether I'm black or white and everything stuck, you know, went up in the air and I was removed from the commission. The other two officers or commissioners who were, um, you know, radically critical of the police were also removed. And um, there were only two people left on the commission, which meant two out of five commissioners, they didn't even have a quorum for voting. So anyways, um, <clears throat> 
these are the things that when I'm watching the news, when I'm watching what's going on in the nation, and I love that there's so much excitement about Black Lives Matter now. You know, it's like literally some of us have been saying this for years. Um, and some people wonder like what, like why would Trayvon Martin's murder be a pivotal moment when we're talking about police reform? Let me just take a minute to, before I get into kind of the things, the checklist of things I really think that um, SPD and any other PD, you know, police departments nationwide need to implement and also mention sheriff offices as well because that's a whole nother um, branch of law enforcement. But before I get there, let me just, just briefly kind of set the stage for the fact that policing itself is based on a racist history in America. And just bear with me because if that turns you off or you think that I'm making it up, <laughs> go, you know, do your research. But when um, we teach African American history or, um, you know, really when they teach American history in general, this should be included. But a lot of times it's cut out, kind of like Juneteenth. It might be the first time you're hearing this, but policing really started um, in the North in America for businesses and it was a for-profit industry in the south in america it started um as plantation police and it was um really for the businesses the the plantations the industry that was um enslaving people of african descent in the south and police were basically slave catchers um they were enforcing um the the law in the south that you know human beings are not um equal basically that you are property if you have african ancestry in the south during that time and so they would enforce that with um any kind of runaway slaves anybody trying to um, escape with the underground railroad also just cooperation, submission, and things like that on plantations was another thing that was enforced by um, the first police. So when, when we look back, when you know, there, there's this like PTSD that's ingrained in black history in America as far as policing. And that goes back to plantation police. Basically policing your enslavement, policing um, you know, against your freedom and in many cases, taking the lives of people who were trying to achieve liberation or freedom or trying to escape that oppression of chattel slavery. So plantation police set the tone for policing and not just up till 1865, um, but actually ongoing during, repara not, not reparations, sorry, <laughs> there weren't reparations, uh, reconstruction. Um, period, the Jim Crow era, on through the you know, civil rights movement, we have police with dogs, you know, attacking peaceful protesters. So there's, you know, during, during the um, segregation, the separate but equal period of Jim Crow in the South and, you know, right after Reconstruction, you know, failed Reconstruction, really, there were um, loitering laws, which you know, in some states still, there are laws that target homeless or people who are jobless. Um, in Spokane, for example, there's a no sit, no lie. If you are sitting or lying on the sidewalk downtown, um, if you're taking a nap, if you're homeless, you can be arrested for that. Um, 90 days in jail, $1,000 fine. If you can't pay your fine, you're probably going to get more jail time um, or some other consequences. So it's like, it's literally illegal to not have money, to not have a house, you know, to not have a job. And that has been going on for quite some time, um, for about a hundred years really, with cops enforcing vagrancy laws and things like that. Now in the South, the reason why that is a, um, an issue of, of ongoing racism within the police force is because in the South, 90% um, 
or above 90%, depending on the state, um, of individuals who were arrested and imprisoned um, by 1900 were actually black males. So by that time, um, the majority of the prison population are has set a tone for being black male. So the loitering laws, the vagrancy, the vagrancy laws um, intersecting with the already racist structure, the institutionalized racism of the plantation police becoming then, you know, the law enforcement enforcing the, you know, you just, slavery just ended, but people didn't automatically have a job and there was no access or opportunity allowed or granted for things like land ownership because reparations were not issued. Um, there was no like land ownership or access to jobs automatically. So there is a sense of um, inequity and um, a setup for arrests. And then of course those arrests and imprisonment led to almost feeding back into the same system of um, slavery because the 13th amendment, you know, there's a, there's a clause there that allows for um, free work basically of anybody who's in prison. So that's kind of the stage that was set. Now moving into 2020, as people start to kind of awaken to um, you know, as Will Smith said, racism didn't just begin, it's just being filmed. And so if we could actually see films of those plantation police, if we could see films of the police enforcing the vagrancy or loitering laws, if we could see films of um, the 1920s lynching period, maybe it would become more real to us. But just because we haven't seen films, I grew up without a TV, so to me, a book is like a movie. Um, a book is no less real than a film. And so having studied the history of um, America as a country, of racism, of even the idea of race in general, as well as policing, um, that history, I can definitely say that um, this is an ongoing issue into 2020. It's no, no surprise that black males, in particular black men, are being targeted and killed, targeted um, with racial bias. And you know we need to be very clear about, yes, law enforcement does kill other people. And yes, there are numbers of other people being killed, oftentimes poor, you know, so, Poverty, um, racism, you know, so classism, racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, um, xenophobia with immigrants or people that don't speak English. There are so many use of force incidences that happen around bias. Okay, so what we're dealing with right now with Black Lives Matter is the bias of police versus, especially white police versus the black community. And that bias is a very specific bias with a specific history. That does not mean there, there aren't other types of bias, there are, and those need to be addressed. In fact, the whole reason why the Spokane Police Department um, was even held accountable is because a white man was killed by cops, a white man with a learning disability. So um, a person who did not understand that the cops were saying to put his hands up and um, was, you know, trying to buy a, a candy bar and, you know, it was a, he was confused. And so because he had a cognitive disability, he was killed. And so that's, that's a justice issue. That actually led to the cry against police brutality in Spokane because Spokane is majority white. So there's a small black population here. However, um, that does not mean that the cops are not, you know, targeting black men disproportionately and that racism isn't an issue because it is in Spokane. And obviously now the nation is waking up to the fact that it's elsewhere. And Native Americans are also, um, you know, in some places actually even a higher demographic of the rates of police brutality or critical incidents where a civilian is killed. 
So when we look at Trump's executive order to register the bad cops and send out a mental health professional, both of which are good ideas, you know, for the co-responder, these are once again suggestions. They need to be mandated or else they will have no effect. And it will be a big flat waste of time. Once again, a whole bunch of window dressing, you know, um, impressive window dressing. Cause you can say, wow, we really worked on this. Look at this big fat binder of all the reports that we cleared as being, you know, basically handled as per protocol by the cops. So we found, you know, not really that much wrong. And the things that we found wrong, we could only just kind of say, well, we suggest you do this, but at the end of the day, it's up to the police whether or not they want to. <laughs> so no more of that. The time is, you know, there's no more patience for little teeny tiny steps that basically get stepped back again, um, you know, one politician at a time. That's just a hamster wheel that we don't want to go around again. So what we need is true, number one, true empowered civilian oversight of law enforcement or wipe and reload the police system. So when they say defund the police, if you know, if we want to go to community policing and, and come up with an entirely different system that's not based on the plantation police, it's not based on, you know, for-profit system, feeding into the prison system that's also for profit, then, you know, that is definitely an option to go that way. That's going to take a lot of overhaul, a lot of people, a lot of money to overhaul that. And that could be done. But if we're not going to overhaul, then we have to have true empowered civilian oversight of law enforcement that's not just recommendation only authority, but decision making equal accountability and authority. Number two, and that, and, and I might say like, so how are, the, how are the civilian oversight people qualified? We went through hundreds of hours of training. Anybody that, that, write, you know, that holds that position has a moral obligation to of course, understand what they're doing, carry that torch in order to be qualified to hold the police accountable. So this isn't just passed out, you know, like free candy. This is something that of course, an individual would have to earn and would have to pay their dues with putting in that time to understand the process um, to do it effectively. Number two, okay, so the first one, truly empowered civilian oversight of law enforcement or wipe and reload the whole process of policing. Number two would be eliminate or reduce the authority of police guilds because police guilds are that, you know, police unions and guilds are the branch that hold um, the kind of protection measures in place for cops that have critical incidents, AKA have killed somebody or used force excessively or have any kind of complaints, legal complaints against them. The police guilds protect those cops. And so it's very hard to get justice for the victims because there are all these unions and even if we get an arrest, an indictment, a conviction and a sentencing of a cop, there's still, you know, that cop can still, if he's been in the police department long enough on the force, he can still get his pension, you know, which is why we see even if um, Chauvin, Officer Chauvin gets convicted of murder, he could still get one or $1.5 million. So that needs to be addressed. Um, if, you know, there, there needs to be like a deal breaker clause, basically like you can lose your pension, you are not able to be protected by the police guilds um, or unions if, you know, an X, Y, Z, if there's a bias incident, if there is ongoing evidence of complaints against an officer, um, hopefully before the actual critical incident happens, these things would be able to be corrected, um, but there's no incentive to correct them if that protection is gonna be in place by the police guild so that when the officer does have a critical incident, you know, that the guild is gonna have their back. So there's like a guarantee that somebody's gonna have your back if you're an officer, and I think that needs to be challenged um, at the level of the guilds and unions and how much they can really um, 
reach, you know, in terms of protecting. Another part of that is, of course, the um, Sioux immunity, the, the, the claws, you know, as far as um, it's harder to charge and convict and sentence um, an officer for a murder case versus a civilian. And that needs to also be addressed so that people are held accountable equal under the law. Number three, use body cams. Now I know some people say, well, you know, we've seen it filmed, doesn't matter, you're still gonna do it. No, there, there's definitely um, less of a chance or likelihood that people will behave badly when they are being filmed. Um, when on camera, people typically are on better behavior. Not always, of course, but we can still reduce the number of incidents by using body, body cameras. In Spokane, we had 220 body cameras. Only 19 of them were being worn. Why? Because it was made optional. No, we need to actually make the body cameras uh, mandated that they must be on, they must be functioning, and some of them do not have sound. I think they should have sound. Um, dash cams and body cams are different sometimes in their technology, so it depends on which ones your city has acquired. Um, I do think that the audio and the video both need to be there for every interaction of police and civilians if people really want to put their money where their mouth is and say that we want to build trust with police. How is that trust built? You've got to prove it because we've seen all the videos up to this point. We need to see different videos. We need to see um, these incidents go a different direction. So we've got to see that. Um, so not only wear the body cameras, get the body cameras, wear the body cameras, make them mandatory to wear, and share the footage with the public. So rec number four, um, I would say that recruitment is a huge issue because Back in the Rodney King riots, black cops walked off the force after the beating of Rodney King. Um, wanted no part of policing. Understandable. However, then it leaves kind of like an even greater void for the community because then you have like all white cops, you know, like if there is no representation on the force, then a lot of times the the needs of the community, specific uh, relevant needs can't be addressed um, as effectively if there isn't full and equal representation for the community that's being policed. If you have a majority um, black community that's being policed by a majority white officers, it's gonna be a different demographic or a different experience, sorry, than if you have um, a different demographic on the police force with mostly black officers supervising, policing, protecting a mostly black community. There is a difference in rapport. There is a difference in understanding. Um, same goes for Latino communities, for you know refugee communities. I think there has to be that representation. And in some cases, there might need to be a co-responder in terms of um, language and other um, interactive uh, situations or barriers between a cop and a civilian so that there is that understanding. As in the AutoZem case, if there had been a mental health prof professional there that could have, you know, kind of explained to the cop that this person has a disability, cannot understand the directions and needs assistance, that could have had a different outcome. So that's number four, the recruitment, you know, of, you know, proportional to the demographics of the community. And also with that recruitment, there needs to be bias screening, um, meaning like some kind of a screening method or testing method for um, cops having bias, racism, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia. Um, that needs to be, you know, really tested. And I also think that, that um, as part of the application process, like it needs to be a qualifying factor to not be biased in those regards. I also think that um, putting on notice, you know, kind of like you do with um, other situations where you have to put kind of an ad in the paper or a little public notice um, that we are considering hiring 
this person for for a cop, the public should be able to weigh in and say, you know, what if there like if there is a domestic violence background maybe that was not reported or you know the person doesn't have any convictions, but there are people who have concerns about that individual's integrity or about their interactions or their demeanor. Those concerns should be able to be brought to um, the police department before that individual is hired. So recruitment and hiring, I think needs definitely to have some overhaul and some reform. Number five, big one is training. Use of force training needs to be redone. Now, the use of force training that I went through, which is what the cops in Spokane are trained with, is a virtual training. It's much like a video game. And much like a lot of video games out there, there is definitely a, you know, a lot of stereotypes and other scenarios in there that um, feed into bias. So, um, you know, the whole, the whole idea of video games having, having bias, racism and sexism built into them, that's another conversation. But this is basically the virtual training for cops is like a video game and the same type of um, programs are used to build it. And so probably some of the same people that build programs like Grand Theft Auto or whatever. So we're looking at a virtual training where you walk into the scenario, you have a gun and a taser, which are, you know, obviously not a real gun and not a real taser, but what it's like um, buttons on video game controllers. Like one's a gun, one's a taser. You decide when to use which device. The virtual training process with SPD, and I would say that, you know, this is not just SPD specific because it's a, it's something that's out there for police departments to use this, this is virtual training. So it's a lot of different departments have a similar process and system. It encourages a kill or be killed scenario. In many of the situations, you have to either shoot the person or they will shoot you. And so if you don't shoot and you get killed in the video game, basically, the, you know, the, the training scenario, then that kind of lodges this sort of fear, like, oh, wow, like, you know, oh, shoot. Like I would, if I was actually in that situation, I would not be going home to my, my children, my husband, my wife, my, what, my family, I would be gone. So you think like it trains the officers to get more, um, I wouldn't say trigger happy, but definitely to, you know, kind of be a little encouraged to use some force because if you don't, it might be you that's going in the body bag. So that particular training, I would also um, just like to add that all of the incidents where you had to either kill or be killed, it was a male and it was a person of color that had to, had to either be killed or that person would kill you. So once again, there needs to be a wiping and reloading of these police training videos and, and you know, virtual re reality scenarios. And that training needs to include prejudice reduction, anti-bias, cultural competency training. There, it's not good enough to just um, assume that everyone's neutral until they prove that they're they're biased. It's probably best to assume that there's bias and there's prejudice a little bit in all of us towards some group or another. And, you know, I do realize that I'm a little prejudiced toward white people. I am. Like, I had really bad experiences growing up and I kind of have a bias against, um, you know, against white males in particular. But um, through, of course, logical reasoning and through, you know, interacting, like I've had um, positive experiences as well. I'm aware of my bias and I haven't um, actually, you know, treated someone differently because of that bias in terms of a professional situation scenario. So I think that bias screening is important. It's also important to know is that bias something that the person has evolved and grown through enough to be, you know, interacting with the population, the demographics that they're going to be around? And 
Um, you know, how is that, how is that prejudice or bias going to affect the job? Now it's popular right now to just say like, I'm not prejudiced. I love everybody equally. I don't see color, all that kind of stuff. But there are ways to sort that out. There are ways to vet someone and to kind of, you know, see where their biases lie. I was accused of having an anti-police bias. Um, and really, you know, I do feel like yeah, I don't buy into the trust but verify model that was set up in Spokane, like trust the police, but just kind of like verify they're doing the right thing. I actually st have a different starting point. I don't trust. So I um, want proof that the, the police are doing the right thing. I want to um, dig into things like the training, like the recruitment, like the use of body cameras, I'm going to assume that there are some cops doing the right thing and some cops that aren't. So let's find out who's who and sort things out and make this a better department, a better structure. Let's deinstitutionalize difference, deinstitutionalize racism. Let's break that all down. So I think that um, you know my starting point is of course a critical lens toward the police department. If you want to call that anti-police bias, you know, knock yourself out. But from my perspective, it's, it's not an anti-police. It is actually just a critical view of the history of policing all the way up to the present day and watching um, with shock and awe and horror, of course, the ongoing killing of black bodies and what that does to your psyche, you cannot then just say, yeah, I trust. I trust, but I'll verify to make sure that that trust is valid. No, it's like if you're in a relationship and somebody is a, it, you know cheats, you're not gonna just assume from then on that it was just a one-time incident. You're gonna assume that that person probably is going to be at least tempted to do that again, if not to do that again. So that trust has been broken and um, I would argue that the trust was never there with law enforcement and the black community because of the history of plantation police. So that trust has to be something that is overtly built, overtly established, and overtly institutionalized in the form of anti-racism, anti-bias being built into the very fabric of police culture. So that's kind of, um, you know, the five things that I have for what I would suggest if I had a voice during this time, which this little YouTube channel is pretty much not really a voice, but um, some people have asked like, what do you think of these things? You know, um, I'm not allowed to speak at marches. I'm not allowed to have a, a job or a title anymore. But if I did, and if I had a, you know, if I was gonna go up to, you know, a city council person or a mayor, I would say empower civilian oversight of law enforcement with decision-making versus recommendation authority or wipe and reload your law enforcement PD. Number two, reduce or eliminate the police guild oversight and unions as far as their reach to protect officers um, from consequences so that we can get those convictions and sentencing Number three, use the body, get the body cameras with audio, use the body cameras, mandate it, and make the footage available to the public. That is another way of building trust. Number four, um, what was number four? Re recruitment, so recruiting um, with equal demographics and representation from the community that's actually being policed you know, the officers protecting those citizens and serving those people, individuals should understand that community beyond um, just a surface, demo, you know, surface like, you know, street names and stuff. There should be an understanding and a rapport that is representative of the community being policed as well as anti-bias screening, um, you know, so officers having screening that are not biased toward people in that community and, um, you know, also putting some kind of a notice out there for the community to weigh in on an individual's record and integrity before hiring them to be an officer. Number five was training. Use of force training needs to be completely overhauled. A lot of bias is built into that and the killer kill, ki killer be killed scenarios 
um, need to be really looked at and examined closely because I do believe that's that's um, establishing a root of fear in an officer that this person will have a weapon or will be killing you. And so there's that, you know, that instinct, that reaction of saving your own life. Um, even if in retrospect, when we're watching the video, there was no, you know, way that that person was in harm's way. There was no way that person was actually going to be killed, that officer. So we're like, why did you say you were threatened? Why did you feel your life was in danger? And I would argue that a lot of that has to do with the training, um, you know, creating that reaction so that, you know, just kind of like a veteran that, that hears fireworks is going to be like triggered to drop to the floor maybe, or think it's, you know, an explosion or a bomb or something. And um, if they've been in war. So similarly, like you ha you build these reactions in in order to protect your life. And I think that a lot of those reactions are based on racism and bias that's built into those training um, systems. So the other thing, of course, um, finally, just, you know, we need to undo this sue immunity, this um, immunity of cops to be convicted and sentenced for murder. And, you know, maybe we can even um, develop some good incentives, some positive things for cops who are doing a great job and are building relationships with the community and are protecting and serving and do something to like maybe give them a bonus or a pay raise or a something, you know, like, like some kind of incentive, like consequences for the bad um, stuff and, you know, incentives for the good stuff. I, I think that's, you know, rewards and punishment are how we're trained as kids. That's how we still operate as adults. We're, you know, motivated to earn a reward. We are also motivated to not get punished. So I'd also just um, mention that, you know, I talked about sheriffs and that's a branch of law enforcement that right now isn't really being addressed, but um, <clears throat> the sheriff only answers to the coroner, which is really weird to me. The sheriff has a lot of power, a lot of authority. Again, that goes back to this whole, um, you know, good old boy network in the South and the racism that was built into policing from the beginning and that kind of wild, wild west, you know, sheriff badge and, you know, nobody, like the sheriff answers to nobody except the coroner, which again, it's just, I think maybe some people don't even know that, but um, the police chief answers to the mayor because the mayor actually appoints the chief police. The mayor chooses, hand picks the chief of police. The sheriff um, is elected by the people. So if you vote for the mayor and you vote for the sheriff, you then have power over law enforcement in your community. So get out that vote. <laughs> um, and once again, we need to demand change, you know, the trust is not there. So just verifying and making recommendations, like we're past that, that hasn't worked. We need to move forward. Um, there's the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, NACOL. I don't really know um, what they're doing in this moment, but um, we had trainings with them. There are different groups and different organizations that have been working on this for a number of years. So this is not something new. But if you go to a city council meeting, if you speak out in your community, I hope you consider, you know, those top five things. The empowerment of civilian oversight of law enforcement um, for decision-making authority, reducing or eliminating the police skills and unions um, power. Number three, using the body cams, you know, with audio and making that, that um, public. Uh, recruiting based on um, representation and anti-bias and then training you know undoing that use of force training that's biased and you know creating some anti-bias training and use of force and I think part of that training also um, you know there's there's the idea of standardizing the weapons or tools so that you know maybe certain officers only have a taser and don't have a gun until they've earned that right to carry that gun um, into cer or certain officers in certain scenarios like maybe don't need a gun. So, you know, if you have just a taser, then the, the 
most you can do is use your taser as opposed to if you have that gun and, and it's like an eeny, meeny, miny, mo between grabbing the taser, grabbing the gun, you know, a lot of that's just going to go back to your training. So hope these ideas are helpful to somebody who's putting it out there. Um, once again, my interim as chair of the um, Office of Police Ombudsman Commission, which is a very long title, the OPO, um, as well as my presidency with the NAACP chapter here in Spokane was very short lived. I got in there and I did a lot of work. Um, some people would say I worked too hard and worked too fast um, and the city wasn't comfortable with it. So my leadership, you know, got canceled and I actually got canceled from everywhere and everything in life, you know, for the last five years, which has really sucked. Um, I try and, you know, keep a cheerful attitude, keep a hopeful attitude. I'm always ready to jump back into the fight. Um, but, you know, as a single mom that's working from home and, you know, with a kid with autism and no job, you know, once again, if these jobs were actually paid positions that would free up younger people to actually take them. I was the youngest um, NAACP chapter president in the whole nation at the time in 2015. Um, I also was the youngest person on the Police Ombudsman Commission, let alone, of course, the chair of the commission. But there are a lot of people that um, do these, you know, jobs, advocacy type positions that are unpaid as kind of retirement efforts and hobby type of jobs. And we really need aggressive, assertive, bold, um, for you know, forward thinking, progressive leadership. And I think a lot of that is going to come from people that are younger, that need jobs, you know, that need an income. Meanwhile, they want to do the work. So we need to have paid work in this regard and um, not just put it on the police departments to somehow, you know, change themselves. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Um, I hope that it makes sense to some of you. And I also did um, come out with a little booklet. I'm gonna do a separate video on, on that. I've mailed it to 31 states now and four countries. It is called How to Combat Hate, Racism and Prejudice, um, a guide for everyday individuals. And it is short, but also, um, you know, gives a lot of, a lot of just practical advice, ways that individuals, teachers, and businesses can combat hate, prejudice, and racism. Um, also within that as well, though, there is um, kind of the need right now, I think, for how to reform police. And so I will be, I'm, I'm working on writing a little, you know, a small booklet um, on how to end police brutality and reform policing. So for whoever's interested, let me know if you'd like a copy of this booklet and I will send it out to you. It's free of charge. Um, I just need your address and you can email that to me. I'll put my email address in the description. And once again, stay strong, keep fighting. Whatever your, your role is, whatever you can do, um, do that and do it well. So um, I do believe that hope is on the horizon. Change is possible and we do need to work hard though to really push these things through um, so that it doesn't just stay the window dressing, the little surface level stuff that we've seen for so long that really doesn't have legs to um, you know, create a just, equitable, and sustainable um, way of deinstitutionalizing racism. So I think right now we're just we're just looking at ways of um, deinstitutionalizing racism, and in particular in policing. And I do believe that that's possible. It's just like you know, strap up your boots because it's going to be a lot of work, and it's going to take all of us. So um, I hope you stay inspired and motivated, and I will see you next time.